Welcome to Lifeline Baptist Church. Thank you for joining us online and on site. It's good to see you. It's been an exciting few days at Lifeline. We've had a great week. We had an incredible trunk or treat. Give all of our cars and trunks and people a hand for providing those cars and trucks. We just had the best night. It was very smooth. Probably one of the best, smoothest trunk or treats that we've had. And we had the police out here, and we had five of us out here, and I think that we had uh, 18 of our own trunks, and then the fire department, and so we had just a great time. And so thank you for being a part of that, for providing the candy. We did not run out of candy. Give the Lord another hand. Thank you for that. Are we having fun with him? Yes. And so we are so thankful that you're here tonight. We're going to have a good time. Had the opportunity this week to witness to a lot of folks uh, because of Trunk or Treat. Was able to give out. I had the uh, bullhorn. And so I was going up and down Man Road and Chico Road and uh, getting to meet people. And so I had uh, have exchanged numbers with many young families that are looking for churches. Say amen. amen. And some of them have called. And so it's been an exciting week. It's been an exciting opportunity to share the gospel with many people, not just people that work trunk or treat, but many people from everywhere. And so thank you for being a part of trunk or treat and for praying for that. We had great, great weather, and we had a great time, and we were safe. We didn't have one rude person. Say amen. amen. And so we just had a great time. Make sure tonight that you have your care and prayer guide for November 2nd, 2022. I cannot believe it's November 2nd, but it is. And remember that time changes Sunday, and we will fall back. And so you get an extra hour of sleep. So no excuse to be late. Say that with me. No excuse to be late. And there's no excuse to be cranky. Go ahead and say that too. No excuse to be cranky. So we're going to have a good time. Tonight let's go over our prayer list and, and pray together. Let's remember to pray for Miss Carolyn Adcock. I heard from her on Sunday, and she's still struggling a little bit. Let's pray for her. Anna Allen, Sharon Bartlett's been with us the last few Sundays. Terry and Wanda Cable, Delton Calhoun, Rose Cooley, Brian and Peggy and Steve Davis all need our prayers. Steve had a biopsy today. We will not know the results of that for a little while, and they took off four liters of fluid. And so he is, uh, he was medicated, and so uh, pray for him, pray that he gets some good rest. Harvey Derrick, Har Brother Harvey's been calling me recently, and so let's continue to pray for Harvey Derrick. Helen Dixon, Dorman and Robbie Ellis, Amy and uh, Dana Fowler, Paulette Gaffer, Clifton and Emma, Glenn and Nancy, uh, Glenn and Esther Glasscock, William and Kathy Glover, please remember to lift them up in your prayer. Michael Griffin is at the hospital battling cancer at UAM, excuse me, at St. Vincent, and he had to have a surgery. And so please remember to pray for Michael uh, Griffin. Bruce and Bernice Henley, Nan Howard, Paul and Pat Kelly, and Miss Hazel, let's remember to pray for them. Last I heard they had COVID, and so I haven't heard uh, more from them, but let's lift them up in our prayers. Teresa Kelly, Mary Lewis, Pam Mathis, and uh, Dee. Uh, Dean Ball, both are uh, under the weather. Let's lift them up in our prayers. That's why we uh, did not have our supper tonight. I appreciate our Lifeline Cafe and missed them tonight. If you appreciate and miss them, give them a hand tonight. Say thank you to them. And we want to pray that they get better. Remember to pray for uh, Bertha Meeks and then uh, also Linda and Terry Perry, that Terry continues to get stronger. And then also, uh, remember to pray for Terry Perry's sister-in-law, um, and Beverly Perry. She's been uh, having some health issues, and so she's a member of our church. Let's remember to pray for Beverly Perry, Ann Romine, Sandy Rockwell, Jean Short, Dave Singleton, Earl Smith. Earl Smith called me on Sunday, and he's our, right now currently, he's our oldest church member. He had taken a fall on Sunday. He's doing okay, and uh, but he uh, wanted to talk to his preacher, so he called me a couple of times on Sunday, and I was glad to get to talk to him. And he uh, had uh, 
It was doing better from his fall, but still struggling just a little bit. So please pray for Earl Smith. And then Bill Spann, Carolyn Spann, and Ferris Spann, Danny Stallnacker, Joy Taylor. Let's remember to lift up Joy Taylor and remember to pray for them. Also tonight, we have Steve Davis, as I've already mentioned, with his biopsy. Shirley Summers is still in Celine Memorial, room 515. She's waiting to go to rehab. And so if you're a deacon on call this week, you can uh, go by and see her. Uh, to our knowledge, she's not at rehab, and I think she would have told me. I talked to her on the phone. Vanny, Vanny Haley is at Briarwood uh, Rehab, room 205. And so let's remember to pray for Vanny and lift her up in our prayers tonight. Also, we want to uh, remember to pray for Jamal and Stephanie's little boy. Remind me of his name. Josiah. Josiah. Let's pray for Josiah tonight. He's been in the Children's Hospital since the, uh, October 21st. And so let's remember to pray for Josiah. I heard from them, from Clemetris. And so we want to remember to lift up Josiah. He's uh, having some issues with keeping his... Uh, his vitamins and everything at, a, at an appropriate level and so they need our prayers Okay. anybody else tonight that we didn't call out your name if you'd like to share with us your request we want to pray for you anybody else tonight let's pray for these that are listed here if you have anybody else did I see a hand if, let's bow our heads and pray for these that are lifted if you know somebody sick or afflicted and, and just not Yes. Caitlin. Okay, let's she remember is, to pray for Caitlin. She has some kind of a, a cut or something and it got all infected. Well, let's pray for Caitlin and lift her up in our prayers. Anybody else? I believe in prayer, don't you? If you do believe in prayer, say amen. amen. Yeah. Okay, let's pray together. Let's bow our heads. Heads bowed and eyes closed. Let's remember to pray for Sydney Ogle. She's having some... Um, gallbladder problems, so lift her up in our prayers as well. If you have an unspoken request, would you indicate that by uplifted hand, please? Okay, we have some. Let's take these before the Lord and ask God to be with these requests tonight. Tom Sops, would you voice our prayer, please? Heavenly Father, we come tonight, Father, giving you all the praise and glory. Father, for your, your blessings that you bestow upon each family here and our church as a whole. Father, these names we lift up to you. We know that you know everyone and you know what the needs are. And Father, Father, we just know that you want to be done. And Father, I thank you for allowing us to gather together here to study your word and to appreciate, Father, that the work that our Pastor Jeff does to bring these lessons to us. Be the lead God direct us in all that we do. And forgive us of our sins. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. And uh, we do not know anything specific on Sydney when they're going to schedule surgery, but just continue to pray for her. Tonight, let's go over our uh, prayer list. If you look at our soldiers, we want to lift them up in our prayers. Kit Bowen, Harrison Day, Brandon Dunlap, and uh, Anthony Hubbard, Josiah Marlowe, Isaac Perez. Isaac is in Tokyo. I've heard from him several times this week. They have had uh, several... Uh, testing of missiles and other things. It's quite alarming in that area, so he's quite concerned. And so please remember to pray for Isaac Perez, Alec Caso, Carson Davis, Gabe Manise, and Kenley Sparks. And let's, let's lift these up in our prayers and pray that God would be with each one of these. Also tonight, pray that God would be with the mayor as he leads our city, our governor as he leads our state, and our president as he leads our country. The other night, the police uh, and the fire department, they were both uh, very excited about the trunk or treat. Uh, we had the, uh, the whole corner basically at one point, uh, up baseline over the overpass all the way down, Chico back around to Man, uh, full of cars. And w one of the policemen made the comment that at, until the very end, until after 7.30, they had had no 911 calls while we had trunk or treat on this corner. Say amen. amen. And we heard, uh, we, we just had a safe, great night. And so we, we didn't hear anybody angry or upset because the traffic was blocked. 
which I had my bullhorn, and I would thank them for, for being patient and, and uh, try to get them to relieve their stress for waiting in line by saying things like, if uh, you're thankful for our workers, honk your horn, and the horns would just go crazy. <laughs> uh, if you're thankful for the Little Rock Police Department, the fire department, honk the horns, and they would go crazy. Could you hear them on the other side, Chad? Yeah. And so I had a lot of fun, and uh, we had folks that I, uh, some old uh, folks that used to, that haven't been going to church anywhere, that I haven't seen in years, came through and said they want to try to be here Sunday, and we just had a blast. And now, we did have one lifeliner, jokingly, I think it was a joke, say, I'd like to take that bullhorn from you. <laughs> and we had a good time. And uh, we kept everybody in. I, I had a lot of energy that night, thank goodness, because we did a lot of walking. And uh, so we, our fire, the firemen even called their family. Did not want us to close down until their family members got here to go for it. And it was a drive-through, and so we just had a great night. Sunday morning, we will announce the best-dressed trunks. We'll give the first prize, second prize, and the third prize. And we have those trunks. That, uh, we know who they are. They're ready to go. We'll do that Sunday morning. But let's pray for our police department, the fire department in our city, and our military folks. Hunter Douglas, would you pray for us, please, and pray for these? <clears throat> We thank you, our Father, for a country where we can come and worship you without fear of arrest and without fear of violence. <coughs> and we pray for those who protect us in all ways, that you will watch over them and help them and help us to, as a society in our country, to back them up and to stand for what's right and to put down what's wrong. For we ask it in Christ's name. As a result of our business and community leaders luncheon, I've had lunch every day this week with a leader of our city or our state. And God is using this church to be salt and light in ways that I just cannot explain. <clears throat> One of those lunches took place Monday, and it was a very unique opportunity. And I was sitting across from a leader that leads a unique group. And he asked me, what does the Bible say about, and he called out a subject. And I was able to share. And then he uh, said, what does the Bible say? And he called out another subject. And so we're able to be salt and light. And this individual had driven, uh, he had heard about Trump or Treat because he was at the last business leader's luncheon. He had never heard of the phrase Trump or Treat, didn't know what it looked like. And he said, I got close enough I could hear you on your, uh, on your microphone, he said. And he said, but the cars were in line. And he said, and I didn't have a child with me, so I didn't stay in line to go through. But we, had, we have an opportunity in this church to be salt and light. And I just ask you to continue to pray that God would use us to be salt and light. This coming Sunday is Veterans Day. And we're going to recognize our veterans. I know that our newsletter went out and some names got advertently missed or left off that and it was not on purpose of our veterans. But we want to recognize all of our veterans on Sunday morning. And so give our veterans a hand and thank them for their service. And so uh, we want to remember to pray for our veterans and lift them up. And so let's pray for these. If you know somebody lost tonight, you want to call their name out, would you call their name out? You know somebody lost tonight that doesn't know Christ. I have a young man that was in my office earlier today, and so I'm not calling his name out because he and his uh, girlfriend hopefully will be uh, joining us, but he's not a believer. So pray for my friend that was in my office earlier today. Pray for a young friend of mine that we've been praying for named Aziz. And then Anton and Dominic. Anton, Aziz, and Dominic. So let's pray for them. If you know of somebody else that's lost, would you call their first name out, please? I just want to say thank you to the Lord for saving Jackson because we were praying for him. We were saved, we were praying for my nephew Jackson. And I can tell you gladly now that we've called his first name out in here, and he got saved in Paragould. And while I was at the Arkansas Baptist. Uh, convention is uh, past some of his pastors were there and uh, 
He wants me to either be at his baptism or to baptize him, so we'll see how that works. But he is so excited about being uh, baptized and being saved. Say amen. amen. And so, and that is, I believe that the direct result of people praying. So you know somebody else that's lost, would you call their first name out, please? Well, let's pray together and pray for the lost. Chad Bilson, would you pray for the lost, please? Heavenly Father, we just come to you right now, Lord. We just thank you for letting us be able to come to a place to worship and hear about you. And Lord, we just uh, thank you so much for the other night, keeping everybody safe. It was just a great time that we had fellowship there. Lord, we just uh, pray now that you work in the lives of those that are looking for something in their lives that might feel far away more than just something's missing in this world we live in right now, Lord. You know, Satan is doing everything he can to destroy families and pull people away. And Lord, there's people heading in the wrong direction every day. We see things that are happening on TV, Lord. God, we just see where our country's heading. We need you more now than ever. Lord, so many people are only you can bring. Only you will give in their life to fill it, Lord. Lord, I thank you for uh, Jackson. And, uh, Lord, just uh, let him come to you, Lord, and give his life to you. And I just, uh, Lord, work mightily in his life. I just, uh, again, Lord, we pray for those that are looking for something more, Lord, that they would find you, that you would find and draw near to them. Lord, we know you will. And uh, God, we just ask this in your name. Three different times today, I received a text that said, may I call so that we can pray. Three different times from three different young men. People are hungry, as Chad prayed in his prayer, for change in their lives and for a God that can bring that change. And so we want to lift these up in our prayer. Well, let's sing together tonight. Worship the Lord. We're going to have fun. Pick out a song that you know. If uh, it's in the hymnal, we'll try our best to sing it. If I don't know it, we'll get Hunter to uh, direct it or somebody. I know he will know them. And so we want to sing. Wow, why? Wow, why? Wow. Tomorrow at noon. At noon tomorrow? Or at 11 30? 11.30. 11.30 tomorrow. Bring your best dessert and your favorite meal. Okay? Or your favorite dish. But we want to bring dessert. A good dessert. Mary, what are we going to sing? 158. 158. Okay. Were you uh, raising your hand about bringing dessert tomorrow too? No, but I will. <laughs> <laughs> we want plenty of good dessert. We're going to have a good time tomorrow at lunch. 158. Nothing but the blood. Aren't you thankful for the blood of Christ? 158. We'll sing the first and the last.
you volunteering, Margaret, to sing the yes. solo back there? <laughs> Wait a minute, Margaret. Yeah. 
as we've been studying tonight. So make sure that you have your Bibles open with me as we take a look at the end of the book of Ephesians. Tonight as we talk about Ephesians, let me remind you that we always look at five things, Genesis to Revelation. One of the young men in my office today asked about Bible study and how do we know that God's Word is God's Word. And so one of the things that we've got to do is disciple young people especially and teach them God's Word in an expository fashion from Genesis to Revelation, word by word, verse by verse, chapter by chapter, book by book, until we have covered the Scriptures. There's never a time that we're going to know everything that we need to know about the Word of God, but we should be good students studying the Word of God. And so we look at five things. We look at the title. We look at the outline. We look at the key verses the individual that God used to write the book, the author of the book, and the date. And tonight we're going to conclude our study in Ephesians. Let me remind you of the outline. Outline part number one, the redemption for the church, Ephesians 1, 1 through 2, 22. Outline part number two, the revelation to the church, Ephesians 3, 1 through 4, 32. And outline part number three, the relationships of the church, Ephesians 5, 1 through 6, 24. And tonight our key verses are in Ephesians chapter 6. And so make sure that you have your Bibles open to Ephesians chapter 6. And we're going to talk about relationships. And tonight in particular, children and parents. Yesterday I had a unique lunch with a young man. And we got through and I explained to him about confessional discipleship. He's been a Christian for some time. And he said, well, I, I've never been discipled. And I said, well, you're in good company. Many people, unfortunately, have never been discipled. Today I talked with him, and he said, I want to take this confessional discipleship stuff. I want to start discipling my wife and my children. Say amen. amen. That's what should be happening in our homes, is we should be discipling one another in the home. I should disciple my wife. She should disciple me. We should disciple our children and sometimes our children will disciple us. But because there's been no discipleship in the church, there's been very little of it in the home. And because of that, our marriages are at an all-time high rate of fracture. Now, divorce, the numbers of divorces are staying about the same, which is unique to me. And that's a number that I look at on a regular basis the number of divorces are staying the same. However, we do have more and more people cohabiting together. They're living together outside of marriage. And then we have a number of people that have children, and those children never grow up in the same house as mom and dad. And again, we never condemn, but we want to disciple. And we ask, why is there so little discipleship in the home? The better question would be, why is there so little discipleship in the church? And so when we think about our families and we begin to think about relationships, my number one relationship should be with God the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. My number two for me should be Pam, and number three should be Ethan and Jane Ellen, then my extended family, and then my uh, church family and my friends, and then ultimately the people that I work with. And those should be the order of which I serve and my priorities as well. And they should talk my prayer list. And so when I'm praying early in the morning, and I'm not saying this to be boastful about prayer, but when I'm praying early in the morning, I begin by making sure that I'm right with God. And again this week somebody asked me, well, how do I pray to God? And I said, well, Jesus said to pray this way. Say it with me. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And we need to teach people to pray. 
And just like the three people that I prayed with earlier today that sent me a text and said, may we call and pray, I teach them, I will say, well, you start us and I'll close us. Sometimes I'll say, well, I'll start us and you close us. And then I will teach them, close us in the name of Jesus. We should pray in his name. You get that, hold up your hand. That's important. I want to know that I'm talking to God. That's why I call it prayer, not meditation. We can meditate without God. But when we're praying, we need to pray to God, the God of all the ages. Because he can do something about our problems. He can do something about our physical problems, our mental problems, our spiritual problems, our marital problems, our financial problems, our family problems, our church problems, and our national problems. He can do something. He can do far more than any of us can ever do, even together. And so we need to understand how important that relationships are. But that number one relationship should be with God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So let's take a look tonight at Ephesians chapter 6 as we think about relationships and we close out this outline. Children, obey your parents and the Lord, for this is right. Children, obey your parents and the Lord, for this is right. I'm convinced, and especially being married to an educator, the reason that we have such problems in our schoolhouse is because we have problems in our houses at home. We have problems with moms and dads and boys and girls. There's no discipline. There's no respect. We've allowed for years the TV to be our babysitter, and now we're allowing these phones to be our babysitter. And so we need to get back and understand that we've got to teach children how to obey mom and dad. When you teach a child to obey mom and dad, ultimately you're teaching a child to obey God. When you're teaching a child to obey mom and dad, which is their first picture of God, then you're not only teaching them to obey God, but to obey the people around them. I taught school briefly for about a year. I was a substitute. They let me do that in my home school system. And I just could not do it. I knew for, for certain that God had called me to preach, number one. And number two, I knew for certain that God had not called me to the classroom. And so, but I do believe that we've got to invest in our children and we've got to discipline. That's one of the reasons last night I took that bullhorn and went to every car. And if they didn't roll their window down, I would look at them and, and do like this. And they knew that that's international language for roll your window down. And they would roll their window down, and I would talk to them and ask them their names and ask them, uh, well, uh, where do you live? And where do you go to church? Well, and that meant most of them, I didn't find but uh, two or three people that told me that they actually had a church the other night, and that whole crowd that said, we, go, we are active in our church. And I said, well, I will not proselyte you. How many of you understand that phrase? Go ahead and hold up. That means I'm not going to talk them into leaving their church and coming to ours. Go ahead and say amen. And, but I said, well, you, you, you do not. They'd say, well, we're looking for one. I'd say, well, you can stop looking. You found one. We will love you here. And then I would ask their children their name. And so, and we had a long line. And I had made it all the way over to the other uh, side of the parking lot. And I was on the uh, side-by-side. -side. Steve had brought me a side-by-side. -side. Give him a hand and thank him for bringing that up here. And so I was on that. I was on the other side. And the car got ready to leave. And I said, I'll see you, Stephen. And he said, well, how do you remember my name? Well, one of the reasons that I ask people names is because I want my mind to work. But I want to know how to pray for them. But more importantly, he had a little child in the back. And that child wanted to know, did I remember his name? Yes, I did. It was Elijah. And so, thank God I remembered it. And I thought, oh, Lord, God, help me to remember his name. And so we've got to learn to communicate with people and to teach them. So he says, children, obey your parents and the Lord, for this is right. Then he quotes for us uh, one of the Ten Commandments from Exodus. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise, which is the first commandment in with a promise. And so, and you know this commandment comes from Exodus chapter 20, verse 12. So children, obey your parents in the Lord. Now, Ephes, uh, the, the people at Ephesus, this is a little different. He's going to talk to us. He talked to us about marriage in, in Ephesians chapter 5. 
And I preached on that recently, so I didn't address it from Ephesians 5, 22 through 33. That is a key passage of scripture on both marriage and the mystery of God. And recently I've taught on that, so I'm not covering that. But go back and read Ephesians 5, 22 through 33, key verses on marriage. And to help us to understand marriage and the mystery of God, the relationship between Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, and the church, the bride. And immediately he moves to children then in chapter 6. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with a promise, so that it may be well with you and that you may live long on the earth. You may live long on the earth. And so that's our promise, to live long on the earth. And then he says in verse 4, Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Now, it's often been asked, why didn't he say fathers and mothers, especially in the world that we live in today? A bulk of the younger guys that I'm discipling, especially the 18 to 26-year-olds, most of them have not lived at home with mom and dad at the same time. In fact, I've got one uh, young fellow whose dad is in his 80s and his mother's about my age, and they've never been in the same house. And so you think about that the average family today may not look like your average family looked like in your day or in my day. But he, tell, he tells fathers, fathers, do not provoke your child to anger. And ultimately, regardless of where the man is living, where the woman is living, he intended for the husband to lead the wife, and he intended for the husband to lead the family, the children. Well, you get that, hold up your hand. Do not ever un underestimate the leadership of the man in the marriage and as a dad. And so we need to understand what that looks like. And so I was blessed, thank God, I had a great mother and a great daddy. And now my mother was the more outspoken one in the relationship, but there was never a doubt in my head or in my heart, my dad was our spiritual leader. And he made sure when I was a child that every night we read the Bible. You know why he would make sure or how? Because he would read it to us. And he would tell us a Bible story. And he would lead us to pray and teach us to pray and lead us to church. That My, my mother was sick a couple of times, a few times going to church. My dad was not. He was always going to be the one to take us to church. He was there the day that I got saved, and he was the second person in the altar that day. I was the first, and as soon as I got down on my knees, I felt a hand on my back, and it was him. And then when we got in the car to go home, he said, I'm going to tell you two things, son. He said, number one, you've gotten saved today, and Satan's going to try his best to make you doubt your salvation. Do not listen to him. And number two, if you really love Jesus Christ for saving you, then you tell everybody that you know that you were saved and how to be saved. Now, that was my dad. It wasn't a seminary professor or another preacher. That was my dad. And so as we think about the role of the dad today, I cannot tell you how many studies that I read day in, day out, week in, week out, month in, month out, year in, year out, about the absentee dad and what the effect that has on the children in the home. And so it's time for us as men to rise up and be the men that God's called us to be and use the, the things that God's given you to the best of your ability, whether you're living with them or you're not living with them, be a positive influence. You can send that student or that child a text right now. Uh, we're half empty nesters. My daughter's gone most of the time. But of the morning, I usually uh, get a text from her first thing, and she'll say, pray for me about this, and I will do that. And immediately I take those texts, regardless of where I'm at. I take Pam's text, uh, Ethan's text, Jane Ellen's text, and my sister's text, wherever I'm at, and, and then I will text her back. And, uh, and almost every night without fail, we will pray over the phone before I go to bed. Now, she does say, Dad, that time's getting earlier and earlier, but that's okay. But, and if I don't call, then she wants to know where I'm at. 
and she wants to know how, why I'm not praying. But we need to, wherever we're at, whatever we're doing, be an influence. We did the grandparenting by grace at church, and I had a number of grandparents that, that uh, said to me, you know, I'm going to start this texting thing. I'm going to send my grandchild a text. And, and I can't tell you how many grandparents came back to me and said, you know, that works. My grandchild responded. Now, you don't preach on the message in the text. I just sent the text. I'm praying for you. Today I sent somebody a text. I'm praying for you. And I put in there Matthew 6.33. I didn't say what Matthew 6.33 said. Why? I do not want them to become lazy and think that I'm always going to give it to them. They need to look it up. You get that? Say amen. Okay? And so that this person texted back a young man that I'd met in Florida, and he said, I'd never read that scripture. I did not know what Matthew 6.33 said. And so you know it. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. And I, then I will say, do you have any specific prayer requests? Do not ask that unless you want those specific prayer requests back and unless you're going to pray for them. And then I will say, I, if they send them to me, I'll say, I am praying now, and I stop right then and pray. And so regardless of where you're at, whether you're with your children, you're not with your children, you're with your grandchildren, you're not with your grandchildren, your cousin, your niece, your nephew, your brother, your sister that's lost, communicate them. Use this phone to share the gospel of Christ and pray for them. And so he says, do not provoke your children. He goes on and he says, Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger. We've got to be real careful with this anger. Sometimes we, we want to uh, tell our children, do what I say, not what I do. It doesn't work. We joke about it, but it does not work. Do what I say, not what I do, does not work. We have to set the example. And I learned but from my own behavior that if I lost my anger or my temper in the house, then I was saying to Pam, it's okay for you to lose your temper as well. And then immediately after our five, first five years of marriage and we had Ethan, if I lost my temper, then I was teaching him, it's okay for you to lose your temper to be angry when it's not okay. The only person with righteous anger is Jesus Christ. And so we need to check our anger at the door. Even if we think that uh, God would be angry too. I heard somebody say the other day, well, I'm angry. And then he said, well, God would be angry too. Well, how do you know you're not God? And God has, it ju is justified in his anger because he has righteous anger and he is going to be angry with sin because it cost him his son. But you and I, most of the time, there is no excuse for our anger. Say that with me. There is no excuse for our anger. And sometimes we are we make people angry by asking either and do not ever apologize for asking your child questions. And in my marriage, my wife and I have the agreement there's nothing that we can't ask one another. Now, the way that I ask it might get me in trouble because sometimes I can be a smart aleck. If you can be a smart aleck every now and again, say, uh-oh, go uh -oh. ahead. Okay. Everybody, oh, even Emma said that, and then she looked at Clifton. I don't know what that means, but I'm not going to their house after church and find out. But uh, as we think about that, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Now, notice discipline comes first, and this is a concept of discipleship. And so instead of teaching them how not to behave, first, I need to teach them how to behave. I need to teach them how to behave. And so I need to not provoke my children to anger, but to discipline them with the discipline of God. And so at, at our house, my mom and dad never sent me to a room. My mother never said to me, go to your room. Now she would say, go to my bedroom and get the belt. And then come in here and bend over wherever you're going to get five licks. And sometimes she'd lose count. <laughs> sometimes that was for my benefit, and sometimes it wasn't, but she'd lose count. And, but she disciplined, but she never sent us to our room. And so I learned something from that. It, I do not send our children, I never sent our children to the room. If I had to discipline them, 
I would say to them, what do you think I should do? One of the worst nights of my life, one of my children said, well, I think you need to spank me. And I said, well, how many licks do you think you need? And this child said, well, I think you better give me the full file. And boy, I was about ready to cry before I ever got to the bedroom to give the five licks with the belt. But here's the deal is that uh, we need to be careful with where we send our children in discipline. We teach our children to isolate. And most of the time we teach them to isolate without God. And then we wonder why when they're teenagers they like isolating without God. And to this day, if both of my children are at the house, hardly ever are they in their room. That's a good thing because they do deserve their privacy. And, and even though I pay the rent on the house, I'm going to go into a room when I feel like I need to, but I'm going to respect them, but I don't have to worry about it because they're hardly ever in their rooms. And so be very careful with how you discipline. Sometimes we set children up to fail because of the way that we discipline the discipline of God should be built upon the discipleship that comes from God's Word. A learner, an abider, an imitator, a follower, and a multiplier. Okay? A learner, an abider, an imitator, a follower, and a multiplier. And so I, when I discipline my child, they're learning from me. And they're going to abide with however I discipline them, whether it's good or bad. And they're going to imitate it sooner or later. And then ultimately they're going to follow the way that I've taught them. And so we've got to get back to what discipline looks like. And then notice that then we can give instruction, further instruction. This is how you do this. And so a lot of times what we do is that we will t uh, tell a child, well, why don't you do anything in the house? Why aren't you carrying your load? Why aren't you doing your chores? Well, a lot of times it's because we didn't give them instructions. And, and we didn't like the way that they did it. And sometimes we think, well, it would just be easier if I do it myself. Just be easier if I, if I cooked all the meals, if I cleaned up the mess, if I did all the laundry, if I made the beds. Just easier. Well, you may think that for a little while, but sooner or later you're not going to think that. And one of my friends, Miss Pat, in the room helped me learn that as an educator with my own child. And so, and a lot of times, and, and she taught me this, we take responsibility for our children and for their behavior when we shouldn't. We should have disciplined them and given them instruction according to the Word of God. Not the Word of Jeff, but the Word of God. And I can guarantee you, if we would give them discipline and instruction based upon the Word of God in the home, the church and the school would be a different place today. If you agree, say amen. amen. And you say, well, why are you talking to us? Many of us, our children are grown and gone. You have grandchildren. Start giving them discipline and instruction. Use your phone to do it. Even if you have to say to, say, and I, I won't say it because she'll do it, if I have to say to my phone and call her Siri, hey, get find me the Bible verse of the day, that's not impossible to send somebody a verse of the day. Give them your favorite verses, and when you run out, give them to them again. Give them to them again. I sent one guy a verse one day, and uh, I won't tell you what the verse said, and he said, I don't think you meant to send this verse. And it told him to do something that I didn't definitely, would not wanted him to do. But I sent the wrong verse. I'd gotten the wrong address. I was two verses off. And, but here's what he said. He said, I looked it up. And I thought, well, Jeff has lost his mind. <laughs> he said, but then I read two verses down and I knew exactly which verse you meant to send me. So I wanted to send it back to you. And he said, LOL. It took me the longest to figure out what LOL was. <laughs> I thought it meant law, a law, and it meant laugh out loud. And sometimes we need a good laugh. And then sometimes as we go back to Scripture, we understand. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger. We have a lot of anger, too much anger in our homes. And that anger is carrying over to everywhere else. But bring your children up in discipline and instruction of the Lord. Not of this self-help book or that self-help book, but of the Lord. Notice verse 5. Slaves, be obedient to those. Be obedient to those who are your masters according to the flesh with fear and trembling, in the sincerity of your heart. Now notice what he's teaching us here. 
Obedience should come not because we have to do it. Not even because we want to do it. It's not an issue of I have to or I want to. It's an issue of my heart. Is my heart right with God? I hear people saying, I'm out in the public a lot and I enjoy it. And I hear people saying, well, nobody wants to work today or nobody knows how to work today or nobody is respectful today. But notice what he says, slaves be obedient to those who are your masters according to the flesh with fear and trembling in the sincerity of your heart. Your heart has to be circumcised and right with Christ regardless. I've had people to tell me, and I've told you this many times before, they'll say, well, you have no bosses. I said, well, think again. I have over 700 members of Lifeline Baptist Church, and my supreme authority is Jesus Christ. And I answer to him. And so if we think that we're ever going to live in a world without bosses, we're wrong. And obedience is not because I have to, not even because I want to, but because I've given my flesh to the Lord and my heart has been circumcised. Then notice what he says at the end of this verse. As to Christ. Not by way of, it, of eye service as men pleasers, but as slaves of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart. The will of God from the heart. And we're going to stop there. Next week, we, we didn't get through with Ephesians, but we'll pick up. We're going to pick up with verse 7. The heart. Friend, I didn't do trunk or treat the other night because I had to. I did want to because I enjoy it, but out of obedience, so that we could be salt and light on this corner. Everywhere I go, I meet men and women and boys and girls that want something they do not have, and they're looking for all kinds of substitutes when Jesus is the real thing, and he's right there with them. Back in the summer, hot July day, driving down Man Road, I was going to go and pick me up some lunch. I passed a young man who was walking. It was a smoldering hot day, over a hundred degrees that day, and I could tell he was huffing it down Man Road, so I. And if you don't know what huffing it means, he was making haste. And I rolled my window down and asked him if he was okay. He said, yes. I said, well, I usually don't give rides, but where are you going? He said, oh, I'm just I'm making sales in the neighborhood. And he said, uh, but I am hot, and I don't have any water. And I said, well, I happen to have an extra bottle of water in the car. I said, you can see it's, not, it's never been opened. I carry a couple in my vehicle. And he said, well, can I have one? And I said, sure thing. He said, well, can I get in the air conditioner for a little while? I said, yes. Long story short is about an hour and 15 minutes later, I got to lead him to Jesus Christ. And he saved. And he was not able to come to church. He came to church on Wednesday night. Some of you probably met him. He would come on Wednesday night while he was making sales in the neighborhood. We'd become good friends. He talked to me this afternoon and he said, Jeff, I've been really praying. He said, I'm 23 now. I feel like it's time for me to make some big decisions for my life. He said, I think God wants me to move back to Arkansas. I think God may be calling me to be a minister like you. He said, I want to be back. He said, when I entered your church, he said, it's just a place of good spirit. He said, I want to be back. 
He's out in Montana. He calls me almost every day. He'll send me a text beforehand and say, may we pray now? You see, that's what it's going to take for us one-on-one -on -one to win people to Jesus, to discipline, to give them the instruction from God's word, not ours. So many of these young students, this 23-year-old young man, they're looking for a safe place filled with the Spirit. So tired, sick, and tired of it. So tonight, that young man is making him three lists. Ten reasons why God would be calling him to serve him as a minister. Ten reasons why, ten things that God would be calling him to do with his life outside of ministry. And the top ten things that he needs to do next with his life. So I want to ask you to pray for my friend Andrew tonight. The sad reality is, is that all day today, I took telephone calls from young men just like Andrew. They want to lock life. We've got a young man the outskirts of Hamburg, Germany tonight that is trying to decide if God wants him to come here, we baptize him, and for us to grow him here, or if God wants him, as he said, to start a lifeline in Hamburg, Germany. People are hungry for the God that we serve, but hear me close, they're just as hungry for your love. That's what sets this church apart, is your love. People of every age, in their 20s, their 30s, their 40s, their 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, and 90s were part of Trump or Truth, having the time of their life. Folks, one of my Close friends said to me the other day, the world's going to hell in a handbasket. You've heard that over and over and over. The world may be, but the church isn't. And it's time for us to live like we're going to heaven. Take some people with us. People want to come to Lifeline because of the love. Pray. Pray. Let's get our hearts fixed. On Jesus. If you're online or you're on site and you've never asked Jesus to save you, ask Jesus to be the Lord of your life. Believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead and confess him. Call on his name to save you. Jim Buchanan, please close us in prayer. Lord, it's encouraging when we hear that uh, your Holy Spirit is still working here. It's when we hear about people being saved, the young men who you call them to ministry. Lord, you've been doing that for 2,000 years. And we're, thankful that, we're thankful that our church is a sanctuary where people feel that they can come here and just bask in the Spirit. So help us to be mindful of that. Help us to be part of that. For we ask in Christ's name. See you tomorrow at YOY. Don't forget to get your great dishes and your better desserts.